An update from Cucuta. Let's speak to Carl Widerquist. He's an economist and associate professor at Georgetown University, joining us here on Set in Doha. Good to have you with us again. Uh, the Secretary of State, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, just saying this at the U.N., that he's calling on the Security Council and countries there to pick a side on Venezuela. Of course, we know that Washington did recognize the opposition leader as the interim president. What is the U.S.'s end game here? Oh, they want, a, they want a friendlier government. I don't think either side in this particular dispute is terribly interested in democracy. But it looks like we're having a, a coup from an undem undemocratic anti-U.S. government to uh, an undemocratic pro-U.S. government, and the, and the U.S. is siding with that. Well, we also know that France, Spain, Germany, and the U.K. all just in the past couple of hours have said unless elections take place in Venezuela within the next eight days, then they will be recognizing Juan Guaido as the interim president. So basically issuing an ultimatum. Uh, is that going to work? And how much pressure is it going to, is this putting on Maduro? I, I don't know if that's going to work. And I don't know the, the actual constitutionality of it. Uh, as long as Maduro has the, has the army behind him, he is still in power. And what the Constitution says should happen in a situation like this, I, I am not entirely sure. But uh, this does put international pressure on him. But he is not a person without friends with Russia and China and other countries lining up on his side. Maduro doesn't have to give up. And uh, I don't think it's terribly likely he's going to call elections and they're going to be free and fair this time. But I also don't think that... Uh, an interim government led by the opposition is going to bring fee and fair elections. It's, it's quite a um, complex situation because Venezuela, as we know, has huge oil reserves, but has recently found itself in a dire economic situation. So many people are saying, well, this maybe had to happen because of the economic situation. It was devastating. It was unsustainable. Uh, we just saw Lucia uh, from Cucuta talking to the refugees that have had to uh, flee the country. So did it have to get to this point? Well, no, it didn't have to get to this point. But this is a very common case to happen in a, a country that has successful exports of of a basic resource like oil. It's called the resource curse. And it can happen in at least three different ways. Sometimes it happens before the oil even starts flowing. Money starts flowing into your currency, investing in oil. That increases the value of your currency, and it devastates all of your other exports, and a lot of businesses go out of business. Or it can happen when the money starts flowing. You have all of this money coming in, but it brings, it brings corruption from outside, and it fosters corruption in the country as these outside moneyed interests look for somebody with only one interest of who's going to sell the oil to them. And they, they help crony dictators get to power. And some elements, I think, happen to this with Chavez and Maduro uh, uh, moving away from democratic practices the, to the extent that they were in place in Venezuela before that. And then you have problems when the, when the prices of the exports go down or when the amount of the amount of resources go out. And then you find that even if there was some prosperity while the resource money was flowing in, when that starts to dissipate, either because price or quantity of your exports, then you can get a very sudden and harsh crisis. Now, Alaska is going through that in a very minor way now. But uh, Venezuela is going through this in an extreme way, but it's certainly not unprecedented amongst resource exporting countries. All right, uh, Carl Weidekrist, we thank you very much for coming in and speaking to us. Thank you. So last year,